Is this visible? Uh, yes, it's uh, okay. visible now. Okay. Students, second. is this visible to all of you? Students, is this visible to all of you? Yes, ma'am. Okay. Okay. You can continue. Okay, thank you very much uh, for having me here. I'm. Uh, it's a. It's an honor for me to be at the forum of uh, P. P. Savani University, Surat. And uh, I can see the students. I think they are of the first year, right? Uh, they are of the first year. So yes, I would like first. to wish them all the best of luck in their venture, in their pursuit of their career, but. I would like to talk about modernism today. Now, when we talk about modernism, you can see that I have uh, placed my title as modernism as Gesamt Kunstwerk. So, what is actually Gesamt Kunstwerk? So, I would like to begin by harping on the above mentioned word Gesamt Kunstwerk. And the reasons why I am referring to it while talking about the literary movement, modernism. Now, this particular term that you see, Gesamt Kunstwerk, is a German word. Gesamt means an amalgamation, a combination in German. It means amalgamation or combination. Whereas Kunstwerk in German represents anything what we know as art. So this term, which I am ascribing modernism to, this particular term, that is Gesamt Kunstwerk, was used by the German philosopher K. F. E. Trandorf. K. F. E. Trandorf was his name, and in his 1827 essay named. Aesthetic oder Lehr von Weltanschauung und Kunst, which in English can be translated as Aesthetics or Doctrine of Worldview and Art. This was that essay where the German philosopher K. F. E. Trandorf first used the term Gesamtkunstwerk. I'm repeating the name of the essay again. It's in German. It's Aesthetic oder Lehr von Weltanschauung und Kunst, which in English can translate or can be translated as aesthetics or doctrine of worldview and art. It was also applied by Richard Wagner, the 19th century German composer, famous for his music drama Ride of the Valkyries. Valkyries, as you know, was even a movie which was starred by Tom Cruise. So <clears throat> Richard Wagner, the 19th century German composer who was famous for his music drama Ride of the Valkyries, exercised the word Gesamt Kunstwerk in his 1849 essay, Art and Revolution. So. <clears throat> just one second. I just uh, lost my connection, I think. Am I audible? Yes, yes, you are audible. Okay, okay, okay. Uh, the word, this word, Gesamt Kunstwerk, literally means synthesis of arts, or as I said, a total work of art. It is because of this reason that I have attached the phrase Gesamt Kunstwerk with modernism, which can be considered as an umbrella term. So if you can uh, change the slide. Yes. If you can change the slide. Is it visible? I have changed. Yeah, uh, I think the students would be a better judge of that. Uh, students, is it visible, the second slide? Hello. 
is okay. it visible the second slide yeah i, I think it's visible okay, okay. <clears throat> so uh Modernism can be considered as an umbrella term and uh, to connote a series of artistic and avant-garde movements taking place from the later stages of the 19th century and becoming gregariously prominent in the 20th century, especially in the first half. And I am in complete agreement with Peter Gay, who in his book Modernism, The Lure of Heresy notes that modernism is far easier to exemplify than to define. This intriguing situation is in itself a tribute to its diverse riches. Its exemplars cover so vast and varied a terrain, painting and sculpture, prose and poetry, music and dance, architecture and design, theater and movies. So mo movements like, as you can see on the screen, movements like Impressionism, Expressionism, Imagism, Vorticism, Fauvism, Cubism, Surrealism, and Dadaism dominated itself as the sturdy pillars of modernism. So now we can see that uh, this particular movement named modernism involves so many so many literary movements so modernism is basically used or rather is being used as an umbrella term all right it is an umbrella which we use in times of protection because the world was so engrossed at that particular point of time because of the world war there were two world wars as you know which took place in the first half of the 20th century and all these movements, all these movements became the tower or rather the umbrella to protect or react to the situation. So Claude Monet's painting, Claude Monet was a painter and his painting, namely the sunrise or woman with a parasol poppies the water lily pond can be exemplified as French Impressionism. Expressionism was a movement presented the world solely from a subjective perspective. Vorticism was a short-lived radical movement in Britain celebrating urbanity and the age of the machine. Fauvism was another interesting movement and Fauve artists used pure, brilliant color aggressively applied straight from the paint tubes to create a sense of an explosion on the canvas. Two other movements were Surrealism and Dadaism. Surrealism and Dadaism bombarded the headquarters of preconceived notions about painting and explored the subconscious and extreme experiments to convey their message. We all know about Pablo Picasso. Picasso spearheaded the Cubist movement in art and which can also be an example thematically conveying the spirit of Gesamt Kunstwerk, that is the total amalgamation. So it conveys the spirit of Gesamt Kunstwerk as Cubism aimed to show all the possible viewpoints of a person or an object all at once. Because when we are seeing something, we don't see that particular thing from one angle we see it from various angles so all those angles all those perceptions were presented now uh, can i have the next slide <clears throat> yeah now modern modernist artists were reacting to the horrendous and egregious episodes of the two imperialist world wars which wrecked havoc on European society. European society, it must be pointed out, was a colonial society. Now, what do I mean by a colonial society? European society was a colonial society in the sense that it had colonies all over the world, especially 
the French, British and Spanish. The wars were a fight to redivide territories. What were these world wars about? These were rather colonial wars which involved the world. The wars were a fight to redivide territories and the German and Japanese desire to create markets for the technological and industrial development. So automatically a European war would naturally point to the direction of a world war which had dire consequences. Now on the left side, can you see the trench warfare? On the left side of the screen, you can see the trench warfare of the First World War. And on the right, you can see the picture of the notorious mushroom smoke during the aftermath of the bombing of Hiroshima and Nagasaki on the 6th and 9th of August 1945 by the United States of America, which was indeed a barbaric blow to even the concept of a compassionate humanity or a religiously benevolent God. If we go on to the next slide, in the next slide you will see that you can see a painting. Can you see the painting in this slide? Are you able to see that yes, painting? Yes, it is visible. Yeah. Yes, yes, it is visible. The painting that you are seeing in front of you has been done by Pablo Picasso, which can be considered as the finest example of Cubist painting. It is named Guernica. But what is the history behind this painting? You can see that this painting is named Guernica. But what was this particular Guernica? Guern you can see this painting that everyone is flummoxed, flabbergasted, appalled. You can see their expressions. That they are all running helter-skelter. But what happened? Basically, what happened was, Guernica was the name of a village. Okay. Guernica was the name of a village. And this village was bombarded by the Nazis. So the title refers to the city of the same name, Guernica, that was bombed by the Nazi planes during the Spanish Civil War. An event that destroyed three quarters of the ancient town, killing and wounding hundreds of civilians in the process. What is the full form of Nazi? The full form of Nazi, you must remember, is National Socialistisch Deutsch Arbitair Partei. And if I say that in English, it is National Socialist German Workers' Party, which was the party or the organization headed by Adolf Hitler. So in the painting, we can note and observe the intricate way by which the horror of war and Hitler's bombing looked like on the ground. Now, if you go on to the next slide, Amrita, if you go on to the next slide, mm -hmm. then uh, the students will be able to see the next painting by the surrealist artist, Salvador Dali. I hope you can see the painting. And this painting by Salvador Dali also depicts the frightened face of the ordinary human being. You can see that this face depicts fear and trembling as the Danish philosopher Soren Kierkegaard had noted in his book Fear and Trembling. So this frightened face of ordinary human beings wanted peace rather than war. And this painting is called Le Visage de la Guerre or in English The Face of War. It was painted in the year 1940. Much earlier in 1893, the expressionist painter Edward Munch sketched his painting known as The Scream. We can look at this picture and say that this picture was anticipating the many brutal horrors waiting to descend upon the people of the 20th century. 
Now, if we can go on to the next slide. Let's go on to the next slide. Yes, it is visible. Yes. I have changed. Yeah, you can see this painting. You can see this painting, which is known as the scream. All right, and the same fear, the same fear can be seen in this painting. This is rather an expressionist painting where the fear can be noted that the which anticipates modernism. So I think the students can understand the point which I'm trying to say. In the next slide, okay, go on to the uh, next slide. Now, I always define modernism, if modernism had a definition per se, that if modernism could be defined at all, <coughs> then it would have been these particular lines. If modernism had to be defined by a quotation, then these lines from the poem, The Second Coming, can be very pertinent. And what do these lines say? Things fall apart. The center cannot hold. Mere anarchy is loosed upon the world. The blood dim tide is loosened. And everywhere the ceremony of innocence is drowned. The best lack all conviction while the others are full of passionate intensity. So we can see that these lines sum up the mood, sum up the general tonality of what modernism was trying to explain. So the center cannot hold, mere anarchy is loosed upon the world. The blood dim tide is loosed and everywhere the ceremony of innocence is drowned. And this line is very important, the best lack all conviction, while the worst are full of passionate intensity. So the best are not doing anything, whereas the worst are filled with all sorts of passionate intensity. So towards the end of the poem, if you read this poem, you will see that towards the end of the poem, W.E.H. speaks of a monster when he says, Hardly are those words out when a vast image of Spiritus Mundi troubles my sight somewhere in sands of the desert. A shape with a lion body and the head of a man. Indeed, it was a brilliant portrayal of the turbulently tumultuous times and the persistence of this memory makes it relevant even today. Now, if we go on to the next slide, we can see a similar theme can be seen in the poem named The Age of Anxiety. Just look at this name. Just look at the title of the poem. It's a very huge poem. It is described as a baroque eclo. But the title itself says what kind of an age modernism was trying to reflect. We can easily say that modernism is the literary movement which was talking about an age of anxiety. And this age of anxiety was penned by Winston Hugh Auden, W. H. Auden. And it was published in 1947, described as a Baroque eclogue. The poem was the last of Auden's long poems. It even won in 1948. The poem highlights human isolation, a condition magnified by the lack of tradition or religious belief in the modern age. It is a long poem, a very long poem in six parts, but it would do well if we can read some of the lines which we can see in this particular slide. Faces along the cling to the average day, the lights must never go out, the music must always play, lest we should see where we are, lost in a haunted wood. Children afraid of the night, who have never been happy or good. Now just look at these words. Look at the selection of the words by Winston Hugh Auden. The words 
lost haunted afraid night never been happy or good what do these words point to look at this lost lost that means isolated forlorn remember john keats's line forlorn the very word is like a bell the words lost then haunted is being haunted a very good thing absolutely not is being afraid a very good thing absolutely not can night guarantee you safety and security like the day i don't think so never been happy or good what is this saying never been happy or good so therefore you are talking about an age of anxiety this is being reflected and this is the literary movement so i'm repeating myself once again because i want to hammer home the point that the words lost haunted afraid night never been happy or good what what does these words point to it points to the desolate theme of isolation frustration and existentialist crisis of the modern individual the existentialist crisis of the modern individual for example if you read ts eliot's hollow men you will see the same emotion when he says we are the hollow men we are the stuffed men leaning together head piece filled with straw our dried voices when we whisper together are quiet and meaningless as wind over dry grass or rats feet over broken glass and after that if you read some more lines in that poem by t s eliot then what do we find we find between the idea and the reality falls the shadow what a great line between the idea and the reality falls the shadow that means that you must have thought of something but the reality is completely different that can be your social dreams your political aspirations your cultural desire but ultimately a big shadow falls over your idea and reality between your idea and reality and modernism is the literature of this shadow so students please understand that when we talk about modernism the reason why we, i am talking about modernism as gesamt kunstwerk is because as i said gesamt it means an amalgamation and kunstwerk means art total body of work total body of art so i am showing it from all perspectives so modernism is showing all the perspectives and very strangely majority of these perspectives are negative are negative how do we see that we see it in that painting by edward munch we see it in the painting by salvador dali la visas de la guerre we see it in the poetry of winston hugh auden and we see it in the poetry of w b yeats and t s eliot but more i want to show you more more will follow so we can go uh, on to the next slide amrita can we go on to the next slide yes yeah i have changed so now wilfred owen who was wilfred owen wilfred owen was a very young man who died in war a very young man so wilfred owen was a poet who had a first hand experience about war and his poetry exists in the pity of war you will hear that many people glorifying war many people are glorifying war but wilfred owen saw it and he was a first has first hand witness to war and he wrote about the pity of war and the poetry exists in the pity he was very able to see that hollowness the hollowness which i talked about in t s eliot's poem so he was very able to see the hollowness of these nationalist wars and his poem the anthem of doomed youth precisely points towards that direction youth is supposed to be vibrant and filled with life isn't it you are also young people what is young life supposed to mean it is supposed to mean enthusiasm vibrancy excitement happiness but 
what descended on the youth during that time in the first half of the 20th century. So youth is supposed to be very vibrant and filled with life. But Wilfred Owen proclaims the youth of the people living during the wars as doomed and having no hope whatsoever. And all of us know very well that the place that has no hope is called hell. We all studied Paradise Lost of John Milton where John Milton had said in 1667 that darkness visible on all sides. So hell has no hope. So let us go on to the next slide. If we go on to the next slide, you will see that it is this hell. It is this hell that T.S. Eliot talks about in his poem. One of my personal favorite poems, The Love Song of J. Alfred Prufrock. Now the epigraph of The Love Song of J. Alfred Prufrock has been borrowed from the poem Inferno. I think all of you have seen students the film Inferno, right? But that was the Inferno which was by, uh, written by Dan Brown. Dan. Hmm. But ah, I, I think think most yes, of yes, I think most of the students have seen it hmm. star Tom, uh, Tom Hanks. And this inferno actually means hell and it is a part, it is the first part of Dante's magnum op opus La Divina Commedia. Dante was an Italian, Dante Alighieri, La Divina Commedia, which means divine comedy. And the first part was named Inferno, which means hell. The first part was named Inferno, the second part was named Purgatorio, and the third part was named Paradiso. So the first part means hell, purgatory, and paradise. So now let us read some lines from this poem. Let me select certain phrases. Patient etherized upon a table. As you can see, that if you read this particular poem, let us go then, you and I, when the evening is spread out against the sky, like a patient etherized upon a table. I think all of you can read the, the lines from the poem. So, but let me just, all of you can read, you can read it on your own, but let me just uh, select certain lines for you. Patient etherized upon a table, number one. Half deserted streets, number two. Restless nights, number three. Sawdust restaurants, number four. Let's just stop here. What is patient etherized upon a table referring to? Loss of health. Half deserted streets, loss of people. Restless nights, loss of comfort. Sawdust restaurants, loss of cleanliness. So loss of health, loss of people. Loss of comfort, loss of cleanliness. So loss, loss, loss and loss. Only loss. So if Prufrock can be considered to be one of the great examples of modernism, then can we say that modernism is also reflecting the literature about loss? So if we read the full poem, next slide. If you read the full poem, we will see that Prufrock's love is a poem of suffering. Because love is not always happiness. Love is also about pain and suffering. So if we read the full poem, we will see that Prufrock's love is a poem of suffering. It is interesting to say that you need to fall in love. And if you fall, obviously there will be in pain, isn't it? They say that you need to fall in love. So if you fall in love, obviously, there will be pain. And this pain of suffering contained in the love song tells us about the existential crisis once again, as we have noted in the previous poems mentioned and also the paintings. Rufo almost becomes like a modern Christ <clears throat> You can see, if you read the lines, 
of the love song of J. Alfred Prufrock, there comes a moment when he says that I am pinned and wriggling on the wall. So at that point of time, when he's pinned and wriggling on the wall, he becomes like a modern Christ who is crucified on the walls of conventionality and small talk gossips. Everywhere you go today, you're filled with these walls of conventionality and gossips, gossips everywhere. So Prufrock says that he has measured his life with coffee spoons. Can you imagine? He has measured his entire life, his whole life with coffee spoons. And you know how small coffee spoons are. And he tries to theorize, but then he says that that is not what I meant at all. And even hallucinates about his head being served as a platter, on a platter. So here is one man who is so confused, who is strolling like a flano on the streets of modernism, finding loss of health, loss of cleanliness, loss of hope. And he's suffering. He's feeling the pain of being in love. He's feeling the fear and nervousness and he's trembling and he becomes this modern Christ. And just like Christ was crucified by the Romans. Similarly, Prufrock is crucified by the wall on the walls of conventionality and small talk gossips. He wants to theorize something, but immediately when he comes to a solution, he says, that is not what I meant at all. That is not what I meant at all. And then he starts hallucinating. He sees that his head is being served on a platter. Indeed, an incredible imagery used by Thomas Stearns Eliot to portray the anxiety of the mind, if not like Auden's anxiety of the age. Now, if we go on to the next slide, I want to talk about <coughs> another person named Ezra Pound, who was also a friend of T.S. Eliot. Ezra Pound's jaunty slogan, make it new, and Virginia Woolf's statement, on or about December 1910, human nature changed, can be cited as apt headlines to define modernism. So if modernism had a newspaper headline, suppose you were to write about modernism and you wanted to uh, talk about this particular headline a newspaper headline to define modernism then what would you say you would refer you would refer to it as make it new which ezra pound had said or virginia Woolf's statement that on or about 1912 human nature changed now look at this poem which you see on your screen now can anybody read this poem you can see that no one understands how to read this poem because this poem by Louis Aragon is it at all a poem? It is just saying A, B, C, D, E, F, G, H, I, J, K, L, M, N, O, P, Q, R, S, T, U, V, W, X, Y, Z. These are the 26 alphabets. But this particular poem is named Suicide. Suicide. La société commitment et suicide. That is, the society is committing suicide. That means that ABCD is something which everything or everyone knows. Why not do something beyond that? Why not do something new? Why stay within the walls of conventionality? Why remain here? That is what Louis Aragon's painting at least makes me interpret because interpretations are open. Interpretation should never be closed in literature. In literature, you see, literature is not a subject like mathematics, which has only one answer. Literature is a subject which depends on your interpretation. And in your orientation program, I would like to stress on that because all of you students are pursuing the liberal arts. And it is known as liberal for a reason because there has to be many angles of perception. You cannot just have one definition, one perception, one interpretation. That's it and final. You are also free to give your interpretation. But that has to have a context. It cannot be anything. It has to have a context. So this particular poem is named Suicide because Louis Aragon, a very important French modernist, you can say, that he is trying to say that do not be crucified and stay within the walls of conventionality. Make it new, just like Ezra Pound. Just like Ezra Pound was talking about, make it new. 
this is also a new kind of poem. We have not seen a poem like this. That uh, we we don't even know that is this a poem? What is this? We are we are being shocked. Some of us might be laughing that what is this? Ye kya kavita hai? This is not a poem, but this is a message. It is trying to tell us something. So this message is that uh, do not stay confined within the walls of conventionality. So. Uh, this particular poem is named suicide and it is nothing more than just another poke at the literary conventions of the then mainstream establishment and its eerie double standards the poem deals with the concepts of what can be and what cannot be considered as literature so this poem that you see in front of you it is stretching the idea it is stretching the idea far enough to make the sound of tearing heard loud and clear because it is a funny imaginary sound in a way it is an elaborate take that take that to all the pretentious overwritten overstuffed writing and critique surrounding it locked in a perfect echo chamber of perpetual self celebration and the irony is that the surrealist movement which i was talking about earlier when i was mentioning salvador dali the surrealist movement itself was locked in an echo chamber of its own and that was a big contributor to its subsequent downfall now can we have the next slide now very interestingly if you see the next slide you are being able to see the famous definition of how to make a dadaist poem by tristan zara tristan zara was a romanian so can you see i'm showing you william butler yeats ireland then i'm showing you ts eliot or winston hughes or in england then i'm showing you louis aragon france then i'm showing you tristan zara romanian so this the almost all of europe was speaking in the same vein now look at this very interesting definition of a poem that tristan zara is telling you how to make but kavita kaise likhe likhe to kaise likhe humko kavita likhna hai to kavita likhe to kaise likhe how to make a dadaist poem dadaist kavita banana hai tristan zara is telling you the answer tristan zara is telling you how to make a dadaist poem and is telling you take a newspaper take a pair of scissors choose any article as long as you are planning to make your poem cut out the article then cut out each of the words that make up this article and put them in a bag shake it gently then make out sorry then take out the scraps one after the other in order in which they left the bag copy conscientiously the poem will be like you so very interestingly if you want to make a dadaist poem you can just you can just experiment it today just today take any newspaper and just apply this you will see that even you have created a dadaist poem maybe your parents will be saying what the hell are you doing by cutting out this newspaper you tell them that we are making a dadaist poem so that would be very interesting but uh, although i am saying it uh, don't try it at home <laughs> because it might become a serious issue with your parents so uh, i would just uh, like to point out that even ts eliot see i'm coming back to ts eliot time and again because ts eliot is one very very important pillar of modernism i would just like to point out that ts eliot even ts eliot used the ammunition from france he used the ammunition from france to bombard the headquarters of contemporary british poetry for example let me read some lines from eliot's poems to prove that particular point i am reading from his poem fragment of an agon and the lines are and you wait for a knock and the turning of a lock for you know the hangman's waiting for you and perhaps you're alive and perhaps you're dead hu ha ha hu ha ha hu 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 knock 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 so you can see 
what did I do? Or rather, what did T.S. Eliot do? He's twisting and turning the sinews of conventional poetry. So Louis Aragon, Tristan Zara, T.S. Eliot, they are all Ezra Pound, Virginia Woolf. They're all against this triviality, this conventionality. They want to break the muscles of conventionality. And therefore, the poems are looking like hoo ha ha, hoo ha ha, knock, 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 knock. So this is what modernism is telling us. This is what modernism is reflecting. And this is from the poem Fragment of an Agon. Read another poem by T.S. Eliot. And uh, this is his, I would say, his magnum opus, that is The Wasteland in 1922. And in the fire sermon, there is a line, namely, twit, 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 jug, 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 jug. So again, we can see that he is breaking these stereotypical lines and he's creating something which evokes distortion. So the poetry of Eliot and the philosophy of Zara, that is Tristan Zara, almost had a very similar point of view, although both were for, from different countries. At that point of time, there was no Facebook or WhatsApp that Tristan Zara would communicate or chat with T.S. Eliot. So you can see that they had no communication whatsoever, but the themes were the same. The themes were the same. So the poetry of Eliot and the philosophy of Tristan Zara almost had a very similar point of view, although both were from different countries. But what was similar in their age? They were both writing in an age of anxiety, pointed out, where things were falling apart, as Yeats was saying. Don't you think that poetry is falling apart? See, W.B. Yeats had said things fall apart, the center cannot hold. You can see these lines. Is the center holding? Twit, 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 jug, 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 jug. Is the center holding or is it falling apart? Hoo ha ha, hoo ha ha, knock, 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 knock. What kind of poetry is this? Things are falling apart. Evoking age of anxiety. You read Winston Hughes, uh, Winston Hugh Auden's poem, The Age of Anxiety, keeping the love song of J. Alfred Prufrock beside you, you will get absolutely similar emotions. Now, I would like you to go on to the next slide. And uh, in this particular slide, as we can see, yes, in front of us, that if modernism had an image, first I said that if modernism had some lines, it would be those lines by WBH, which I am continuously repeating, things fall apart, center cannot hold, mere anarchy is loosed upon the world. But what if someone asks you, Jacha, modernism, modernism ka koi image agar ho to kya hoga ho? What would be that image? That image, according to me, would be a kind of a non-image. A non-image of Godot, waiting for Godot, or which was written first in French, Anatada Godot. If you read this play, huh, if you read this play, Waiting for Godot, there is a play, it's a famous play, as your uh, teacher, Professor Amrita Das, will also tell you, that uh, Waiting for Godot is a play where these two characters, namely Vladimir and Estragon, they are waiting and waiting and waiting for this character, but this person does not come, and this person is Godot. G O D O T, Godo. And when they are asked, to, there are two other characters, namely Lucky and Podzo. When Lucky and Podzo defines the master slave Hegelian dialectic, if I have to use very strong words, then you will see that when Vladimir and Estragon are asked, that Have you seen Godo? They are saying, Not sure. Do you know how Godo looks like? No. Then why are you waiting for Godo? I don't know. A very interesting event happened in the life of Samuel Beckett. Samuel Beckett was once stabbed from behind. He was once stabbed from behind. And when that person who was caught later on, then late, then incarcerated by the police, when Samuel Beckett asked this person that, why did you stab me? The answer was, je ne sais pas, monsieur. Je ne sais pas, monsieur. And those people, if you know French, 
यू विल नो द जन सभा मसूर मीन्स आई डोंट नो सर क्यों किया मुझे पता नहीं है कौन है गुडो मुझे पता नहीं है क्यों वेट कर रहे हो मुझे पता नहीं है सो दिस एब्सोल्यूट लैक ऑफ नॉलेज अबाउट व्हाई आई एम डूइंग व्हाट आई एम डूइंग कैन बी टॉक्ड अबाउट एज एब्सर्डिज्म यू सी मेनी स्कॉलर्स टुडे से दैट ओ सैमुअल बेकेट्स प्लेस आर नॉट एब्सर्ड एट ऑल बट दे फॉरगेट व्हाट मार्टिन एस्लिन हैड एक्चुअली सेड व्हाट डिड मार्टिन एस्लिन से See, when we talk about absurdism, I am saying that absurdism was a key component of modernist drama. If if we highlight some of the major works by Samuel Beckett, Eugene Ionesco, and also Harold Pinter or Jean Genet, and even I think the Italian playwright Luigi Pirandello. But what did Martin Eslin say? Many scholars forget, and they say that no, Samuel Beckett's plays are not talking about anything that is absurd. But Martin Eslin had said that the theatre of the absurd is a theatrical embodiment. I'm repeating myself once again. That Martin Eslin, a very important scholar, had said in his book, The Theatre of the Absurd, that absurdism, that absurd, is a theatrical embodiment and manifestation of existentialism it is a part reality and part nightmare and i am uh, reminded of the irish critic vivian mercier vivian mercier and uh, samuel beckett was also irish and he was even a great cricketer if you know he, he was also a good cricketer he was a good batsman Now, this critic named Vivian Mercier had noted that Beckett's play *Waiting for Godot* has achieved a theatrical impossibility. Why? See, this play has happened, but still, the Irish critic Vivian Mercier is saying that this play is a theatrical impossibility. But you will be saying, "Arey, play to hua hai, to ye to possible hai." लेकिन विवियन मर्सियर क्या कह रहा है विवियन मर्सियर इज सेइंग दैट इट इज अ प्ले इन व्हिच नथिंग हैपेंस दैट येट कीप्स द ऑडियंस ग्लूड टू देयर सीट्स व्हाट्स मोर सिंस द सेकंड एक्ट इज अ सटली डिफरेंट रिप्राइज ऑफ द फर्स्ट ही हैज रिटन अ प्ले इन व्हिच नथिंग हैपेंस ट्वाइस वेरी इंटरेस्टिंग नथिंग हैपेंस बट ट्वाइस the subjectivity of nothing has to be looked on what is nothing so uh, if we go on to the next slide the next in the next slide we will see uh, on the left hand side we can see a picture of the play waiting for a godo can you see that students can you see it yes okay. sir yes on the left hand side you will see a picture of the play waiting for godo and on the right we can see another picture but this is from a different play by samuel beckett and this play is known as end game not the end game of avengers i think all of you have seen the end game of avengers but this is not something to do with avengers but this is the play named end game by samuel beckett where we are seeing that two people are raising their heads from dustbins absolute dilapidation now both these plays waiting for godo and in game both these plays they harp on the theme of nothingness professor amrita will tell you later in detail when she will teach you all these things but uh, uh, even she has studied and she has also felt the same kind of existential crisis because yes yes this reminds me of cg's classes exactly so you think that even your teacher when she has read it she was also suffering from an existential crisis we all will do because these are plays these are plays which reflect something more more about life it tells us more about the mundane everyday morbidness of society 
now in fact nothingness this theme which i am talking about nothingness which in bengali we say shunnata i don't know what is it uh, called in hindi uh, nothingness has been used by many modernists for example if you know the name of albert camus albert camus now albert camus play caligula if you read the first page suppose you are reading a play and that play is named caligula caligula and that play has been written by albert camus the first page you will read what is it ria tujuria ria tujuria which means nothing always nothing nothing always nothing the french philosopher jean paul sartre had written a book in 1943 named let in your in english that is being and nothingness and ernest hemingway in uh, ernest hemingway by the way was an american so now i have gone to america see from ireland england france romania now i am going to america ernest hemingway had written a short story ernest hemingway had written a short story and that short story is named a clean well lighted place and in a clean well lighted place there is the christian lord's prayer which has been rearranged and by the christian lord's prayer i think uh, students might know the lord's prayer i think you know that it is in your school you must have learnt it that the lord's prayer is our father who art in heaven hallowed be thy name thy kingdom come thy will be done etc etc i am not repeating it but what ernest hemingway has done is that he has rearranged the christian lord's prayer by using the spanish word nada nada and what what do we mean in spanish nada means nothingness so for example if we read the lord's prayer our father who art in heaven it will ernest hemingway has has written our neda who art in neda so our father who art in heaven becomes our nothing who is in heaven nothing will be done nothing will come so he has absolutely mocked christianity he has absolutely mocked christianity because christianity talks about hope but people who had seen the two world wars they were asking you are hope kaha hai what is where is hope when bombs are falling from the sky when bombs are falling from the sky when poetry is sounding like the bullets da 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 dadaism when poetry was sounding like bullets kaha se ye aasha laaye hum hope kaha hai bhai where is your god where is that benevolent god so that notion of a benevolent god was completely destroyed and if your uh, religious hopes are dashed it can be dangerous you can sometimes become a nihilist so it is a complete mockery and you can say it is a critique on christianity this particular short story so nada means nothing and here this story that is a clean well lighted place is also symbolizing this loss of faith which i had talked about in while while talking about w h auden's poem the age of anxiety and we have samuel beckett's waiting for bodo where one of the characters exclaim nothing happens nobody goes nobody comes it's awful nothing happens nobody comes nobody goes it's awful so the play this play by samuel beckett i'm returning again this play by samuel beckett never really shows us godo ha huh. and uh, uh, professor amrita das was talking about dr chinmoy guho uh, who students we are from calcutta university and uh, dr chinmoy guho of calcutta university had written an essay in bengali and uh, that particular essay was named shunnatar mahakabbo so if we translate that in english it can be called an epic of nothingness uh, am i right amrita i yes, think it's yes, called yes. an epic of nothingness so over there uh, we get to know that beckett was once stabbed as we know and 
he had evoked Jinseba Masur, which is again talking about Neda. Remember, Neda of a clean, well lighted place and the nothingness of Beckett, they are all colliding. And we can see on the picture that Ham, the, a character named Ham, Ham's parents, Nag and Nell, are appearing from dustbin. And this constant tension in, in the end game is whether Clove will leave Ham or not. There are two characters like. Uh, waiting for Bodo. Here they are Ham and Clove and Nag and Nell. Nag and Nell are coming out from dustbins and Ham and Clove. There's this continuous tension that whether they will be together or not. So, if we talk about Endgame, that is the Beckett's Endgame, not the Avenger Endgame. So, Ham continually tells Clove to leave him alone but pulls him back before an exit is possible. Both wonder out loud why they stay with each other but both men give reasons in long monologues for why they put up with each other their empty lives are filled only with unyielding pain and none of life's typical consolations help them there is no cure for being on earth as ham often says one of the unspoken themes in the play is that having someone else around even an irritant helps assuage that pain. But Ham and Clove's unwillingness to face this pain alone somehow makes the pain greater and their complementary dominant submissive pairing highlights their numbing dependency. Samuel Beckett has compared Ham and Clove's tense codependency to his own relationship with his wife in the 1950s. Both wanted to leave the other but were afraid to leave. And Nag and Nell have a happier marriage in part because Nell, at least, is willing to accept that they cannot rely on each other and must exist in separate dustbins. What a... I, I can't say, I can't use the word brilliant. I was just going to use the word brilliant, but I can't use the word brilliant. It is so, I would say disgusting, but disgusting brilliance. If there exists any such paradoxical phrase, I would use it. Disgusting brilliance. Now, Professor Amrita, can you go on to the next slide? If you go on to the next slide, you will see uh, that an anti-play. All right. This particular play, which you, which you can uh, see in front of you, is uh, that is uh, Eugene Ionesco's The Bald Soprano. It is often called an anti-play. Now, what do I mean by an anti-play? It is an anti-play. Similarly, just like Tristram Shandy is known as an anti-novel, this is an anti-play. This bald prima donna or La Canta Trishov was called an anti-play. And the play is an important example of the theater of the absurd because it consists mainly of a series of meaningless conversations. I'm going to tell you about those conversations so that you can understand that meaningless babbling. Now, there are two characters, there are four characters rather, Mr. and Mrs. Martin and Mr. and Mrs. Smith. And at the end, we can see that language also falls apart. Society is falling apart culturally, politically, and now even linguistically. Because if you read this play, the characters in the end of the play start saying, Kaka, 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 kaka. Now you will be asking, what is what is kaka? Even I don't know what is kaka. It is meaningless, absolute meaningless. Then suddenly the characters start saying A E I O U, A E I O U, A E I O U, B C D, F G L, M N P, R S T, V W X Z. If you read this play, you will understand that you are not understanding at all. Because if you do not understand the context, you will not understand modernism. And then if we go on to the next play, La Licon, the, in the lesson we will see, in the, in the lesson we see that a teacher is killing the student. And in this play named The Chairs, we can see two elderly couple talk to invisible people on chairs. Later they commit suicide. All through the play, we can see that in this play named The Chairs, they have been waiting for a message. So there is a play named The Chairs. 
and the stage is filled with chairs and there are two people talking and sometimes they keep on saying wait for the message wait for the message and the audience is patiently waiting for the message but when the messenger finally comes we see that the orator is a flibberty jibbe who is a flibberty jibbe who keeps uttering dumb and incomprehensible words who keeps on talking but this flibberty jibbe is uttering dumb and incomprehensible words which make no sense the play rhinoceros the play rhinoceros that is ug ninesco's my one of my favorite plays rhinoceros talks about a virus talks about a virus named rhinoceritis and if it infects human beings people are transformed into hard skin patchy dance so in this play which is i think a play which talks about the uh, desire to convert yourself in the face of a strong and uh, harsh enemy everyone was con being uh, converted to a nazi at that point of time so this play rhinoceros it talks about a virus named rhinoceritis and if it infects human beings people are transformed into hard skinned patchy derms now this was a play which showed how people conform by drowning their rationality within totalitarian regimes and the 20th century was also witness to the rise of totalitarian dictatorships and leaders Ionesco wrote a play named The Leader yeah. where the characters wait for the leader to arrive but when he finally comes the leader is a headless uh, one easily this fits into the modernist themes of disillusion and distortion now if we can go on to the next slide if we can go on to the next slide we can see that uh, Luigi Pirandello's six characters in search of an author is in front of us. Now, Pirandello's six characters in search of an author also illustrates this quality of distortion which I have been talking about when he amalgamates meta theater and absurdism. You have all I think uh, you will be reading later on the poems of John Donne uh, and you will be acquainted to metaphysical poetry but this is meta theater which is a theater which talks more about the semiotics of theater so he amalgamates meta theater and absurdism pirandello uses the theater itself to challenge the apparent division between fantasy and reality echoing the audience's likely reaction to the play the actors and the manager point out that they know intuitively that they live in the real world and the characters live in a fictional one but there is a character named the father who argues that the very purpose of theater is to bring fantasy to life to challenge people's concepts of reality separated by nationalities but if examined closely we will see that the themes of beckett the themes of ionesco the themes of pirandello explore what stephen spender in his essay the modern as a vision of the whole writes and what does stephen spender write in his essay named the modern as a vision of the whole he says that realization through art of the modern experience of distortion very interesting right the realization through art of the modern experience and of distortion now let us go on to the next slide in the next slide we will see the german dramatist petold brecht who experimented with a interesting technique you see petold brecht is such an important playwright with respect to modernism because he by using his strategy named Wolfram Dung's effect which is also known as alienation effect Wolfram by by talking about the Wolfram Dung's effect he's talking about the audience who should have a critical perception that the alienation effect attempts to combat 
emotional manipulation in the theater because many people you see they laugh when the characters are laughing they cry when the characters are crying so break the sing resistless do not fall into the willing suspension of disbelief combat emotional manipulation and by combating this emotional manipulation replace it with an entertaining or surprising jolt for instance rather than investing in or becoming their characters they might emotionally step away and demonstrate them with cool witty and skillful self pity the director could break the fourth wall so the director is breaking the fourth wall and exposes the technology of theater to the audience in amusing ways or a technique known as the social jest could be used to expose unjust social power relationships so the audience sees these relationships in a new way the social guest uh, uh, sorry the social guest is an exaggerated gesture or action that is not to be taken literally but which critically demonstrates a social relationship or power imbalance let us go on to the next slide in the next slide we will see that so far what i have been talking about morbidity dilapidation existential crisis and we will see that existential crisis is not only found in the poetry paintings and theater but also in novels also in novels and in these novels since it is easily seen in these novels it expands modernism scope some prominent modernist novelists are albert camus franz kafka virginia woolf joseph conrad <clears throat> and william golding albert camus novel the plague it is a novel about a plague epidemic in the large algerian city of oran rius colique castel becomes certain that the illness is the bubonic plague he and dr rieu are forced to confront this indifference and denial of the authorities and other doctors in their attempts to urge quick decisive action so it's a very similar thing which happened to <coughs> our country during the corona virus pandemic that authorities were not quick to realize the problem so albert camus the outsider another novel reflects the existential crisis of human life it is through the action and the works of the main protagonist and his relation with other characters and thus we can consider the novel as existentialist example the trial by franz kafka is a novel by the visionary Franz Kafka which was originally published posthumously in 1925 one of Kafka's major works and perhaps his most pessimistic story the surreal story of a young man who finds himself caught up in the mindless bureaucracy of the law has become synonymous with the anxieties and sense of alienation of the modern age and with an ordinary person's struggle against an unreasoning and unreasonable authority it is often considered to be an imaginative anticipation of totalitarianism and can be described as an existentialist novel because even if sartre and camus would not have written the trial most of the themes developed by the existentialist philosophies are represented here this is the same kafka who had written the short story named metamorphosis where the protagonist gregor samsa awoke from his bed after having uneasy dreams only to find himself turned into a gigantic insect earlier i had talked about wolf saying that on or about december 1910 human nature changed 5 years later gregor samsa changed from a human being into an insect if you read that first line of kafka's short story metamorphosis you will see that one day 
I woke up to fi find myself transformed into an insect. So, the same thing, we have also seen how poetry changed, paintings changed, theater changed, and we are noting how novels are also changing. Look at Virginia Woolf's novel, Orlando. Interestingly, this is also a novel depicting radical change where we see a character named Orlando who is born as a male in Elizabethan society, but he changes into a woman and lives for 300 years into modern times and that too without aging. The American scholar Victoria Smith argued that the book is about the impossibility of representing the female experience in its entirety as a recurring theme of the book is Orlando's inability to properly describe emotions, people, and even such banal occurrences as a sunset. Let us go on to James Joyce. In James Joyce's masterpiece, which was published in the same date as that of The Wasteland in 1922, experiments with the language of the subconscious. Readers and students will be bewildered when they are confronted with a character named Molly Bloom's speech. Do you know how many pages Molly Bloom's speech goes on for? It goes on for about 40 pages without any full stop or a comma or any punctuation whatsoever. 40 pages continuous. This was also a radical moving away from the omniscient narrative techniques that were prevalent during the Victorian age. Conrad's novella the Secret Sharer explores the alienation of a captain. There is a novella by Joseph Conrad who had written the, the Secret Sharer. And over here, the captain says that I am a stranger to my own self. And he mysteriously talks to a completely stranger, a naked stranger whom he calls his other or double. It is a perfect example of the fragmentation of the human psyche that was taking place during the particular framework of the time. Golding's, William Golding's novel, Lord of the Flies. What is Lord of the Flies? I think it is a perfect deconstruction of children as figures of innocence because once you read Lord of the Flies, I don't think you will say that children are innocent caricatures, symbols of innocence. No. Because in this novel, we hear the story of a group of English schoolboys marooned on a tropical island after their plane is shot down during the war. And free from the rules and structures of civilization and society, the boys on the island in the Lord of the Flies descend into complete savagery, absolute complete savagery. So now let us go on to the next slide. <coughs> yes. Now we come to films. Peter Gay, in his book, Modernism, Lure of Heresy, has called films as the most modern of all other arts. Now, in this slide, I have shown three pillars of the film world whose works express the idea of modernism. Number one is Sergei Eisenstein. Sergei Eisenstein was a product of the Russian Revolution. The Russian Revolution, which saw the creation of the first worker state in the history of the world. That revolution which changed the shape of 20th century. And in his masterpiece, Battleship Potemkin, I think all of you should see this film. In his masterpiece, Battleship Potemkin, which is a film showing the workers revolting against the oppressive working conditions. We see that when they are fed rancid meat, the sailors on battleship Potemkin revolt against their harsh conditions. Led by Vakulinchuk, Alexander Antonov, the sailors kill the officers of the ship to gain their freedom. Vakulinchuk is also killed and the people of Odessa honor him as a symbol of the revolution. Tsarist soldiers arrive and massacre the civilians to, quill, uh, to crush and quell the uprising. But a squadron of ships is sent to overthrow the Potemkin. But the ships side with the revolt and refuse to attack. 
this is what was shown in battleship potemkin in another masterpiece named modern times we find the iconic little tramp sir charles chaplin employed at a state of the art factory where the inescapable machinery completely overwhelms him and where various mishaps keep getting him sent to prison this is another movie that you must watch you must watch i think you can watch it today in the evening i think it is available in youtube in between his various jail stints he meets and befriends an orphan girl and this orphan girl is uh i mean starring paulette godard both together and apart they try to contend with the difficulties of modern life with the tramp working as a waiter and eventually a performer although thematically showing us the disillusion and despair the film ends with a note of hope then on the right hand side of your screen you will be able to see orson wells orson wells was another avaga movie maker certainly to modernist observers the course of wells life especially in his later years serves to confirm that long cherished legend about the unconventional genius doomed to defeat by mediocrity many of you watched netflix today i think this movie is available on netflix his movie citizen kane is a wonderful example of the isolation and loneliness that has been talked about earlier when i was talking about proof frog age of anxiety wilfred owen's poetry so this isolation can uh, isolation frustration and loneliness can also be seen in citizen kane when a reporter is assigned to decipher newspaper magnate charles foster kane's dying words his investigation gradually reveals the fascinating portrait of a complex man who rose from obscurity to staggering heights Though Kane's friend and colleague, Jedediah Leland, that is Joseph Cotton, and his mistress, Susan Alexander, shed fragments of light on Kane's life, the reporter fears he may never penetrate the mystery of an elusive man's final word, Rosebud. So, therefore, we see what modernism has encompassed. As I said. this is the reason why modernism is a gazam coast work a total work of art what did i show you today films novels short stories paintings poems but all of them shouting out the same kind of tone the same emotion so we see that modernism encompassed a whole range of literary movements it was a synthesis of the totality of art gesamt kunstwerk it was a synthesis of the totality of art which expressing the themes of what it meant to be modern and living in an age of great social cultural political and economic turbulence it is because of this synesthesia in the arts i'm repeating myself once again it is because of this synesthesia in the arts that modernism has been defined as gesamt kunstwerk it is expressed or rather it it expresses the cultural disenfranchisement of the age which lacked a direction the hollowness and emptiness forced ts eliot to fill up europe's vacuum with upanishadic and buddhist concepts and characters from greek literature and dante's poetry it was a time when the paintings of salvador dali expressed themes similar to kafka's novel and resemblances can be seen in the theater of ionesco and the poetry of tristan zara as i come to my conclusion i am reminded of the great russian modernist named fyodor dostoyevsky and in these traumatic times when we are being bombarded by meteorites of repetition what if i tell you that fyodor dostoyevsky 
had predicted this kind of an invisible enemy like the one similar to the coronavirus. What if I tell you that Fyodor Dostoevsky, in his book, Crime and Punishment, the Russian name for crime and punishment was Prestuplinia in Akazakia. Prestuplinia in Akazakia. And this is called Crime and Punishment. So in Crime and Punishment, I would be reading one page. Strangely, you will see that it talks about the situation we are in today, that we are all stuck in our homes, fearing this coronavirus. Let me just read to you this novel, one page from this novel, Crime and Punishment. This, just hear this. He writes, Dostoevsky writes, He was in the hospital from the middle of Lent till after Easter. When he was better, he remembered the dreams he had while he was feverish and delirious. He dreamt that the whole world was condemned to a terrible, new, strange pandemic that had come to Europe from the depths of Asia. All were to be destroyed except a very few chosen ones. Some new sorts of microbes were attacking the bodies of men, but these microbes were endowed with intelligence and will. Men attacked by them became at once mad and furious, but never had men considered themselves so intellectual and so completely in possession of the truth as these sufferers never had they considered their decisions, their scientific conclusions, their moral convictions so infallible. Whole villages, whole towns and people went mad from this infection. All were excited and did not understand one another. Each thought that he had, he alone had the truth and was wretched and was wretched looking at the others, beat himself on the breast, wept and wrung his hands. They did not know how to judge and could not agree what to consider evil. So you can see, I don't know how this person has managed to write because he has written this in the late 19th century and this reflects the tormentable situation that we find ourselves today. And I would like to end by referring to some lines from Wilfred Owen's poem named Dulce a decorum est, which means it is sweet and fitting, but it is an ironic gesture as this poem is about war and war is anything but sweet and fitting. Anything but sweet and fitting. So, what are these lines? If in some smothering dreams you too could pace behind the wagon that we flung him in and watch the white eyes writhing in his face, his hanging face like a devil's sick of sin, if you could hear at every jolt the blood come gargling from the fourth corrupted lungs, obscene as cancer, bitter as the cud of vile, incurable sores on innocent tongues. My friend, you would not tell with such high zest to children ardent for some desperate glory. The old lie, dulce e decorum est, pro patria mori. So, with these lines, I would like to end. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you for sharing your thoughts. And now, students, do you have any question you can ask? <clears throat> I hope I managed to uh, clarify what modernism was about. Yes, yes, yes. And it's really very interesting. It reminds me, it reminds me everything of our MA classes. Okay, so you want to... Thank you, sir. Thank you, sir. Hmm. Mansi, yes. you want to ask anything? Because uh, we will read it. Okay, so no one wants. Yes, you can ask anything. No, ma'am. Okay. Okay. So with this, we are ending today's session, and thank you once again. Thank you. And uh, thank you for having me. Okay. And uh, 
we will meet tomorrow for another orientation program okay uh, you can leave now you all can leave now